Professor Bohr, thank you so much for joining me today. So first of all, could you share with us how do you perceive Chinese socialism and also the socialist democracy with Chinese characteristics? In other words, is the uh, whole process people's democracy. Mm. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to uh, have a discussion on uh, this particular topic again. Uh, I, I think the phrase or description, whole process people's democracy, is actually a very good one uh, because it explains more about the type of democracy uh, that is developing and is established in China. Because when you, when you say, you know, especially talking internationally, socialist democracy, you think, well, what's that? How does that relate to democracy, people say? Uh, but when you say whole process people's democracy, then you're talking about what it literally says, a whole process. So, you know, the two main components, if you like, and they're in a dialectical relationship with each other, one aspect is electoral democracy, and elections are held right through for the many levels of the People's Congresses, uh, the five levels, first two levels direct, and then the next three levels indirect, right up to the National People's Congress. But then you've also got this comprehensive process of consultation. And that's the other side of it, which is integral to the whole system. It's not extra to the system, it's integral to the whole system. And this goes way back before the founding of the New China. Um, it's already in, in the period leading up to the establishment of the New China that these practices were developed, whether it's with mass organizations, grassroots uh, activities, grassroots governance, and so on. And it's not as though you've got separate sides, they interact all the way through, all the way through. And of course, the People's Political Consultative Conferences are the institutional manifestation of the consultation, consultative process. Um, so you've got all of that. That's what I, when you say whole process people's democracy, that's what you're talking about. Everything is around, is, is part of the process. Mm. So from uh, electoral, consultative, grassroots to leadership of the CPC and um, right. rule of law. That's so right. each segment together make the whole process. Exactly. And democracy. yes, no, you, and very good to mention the, the leadership, the CPC, uh, and also rule of law. Um, the, the phrase, the, the terminology for that is uh, statutory processes that the, the will or decisions of the CPC and the will of the people manifested through electron consultative democracy have to go through a whole series of statutory processes uh, before there actually a decision is made about them and they're owned in the democratic process itself. And that's absolutely crucial, that, that sort of mediation process. And that's what the whole system does. It mediates it, it provides the mechanisms for connections between uh, the will or decisions of the CPC and the will of the people. For Westerners, this one is very tough to understand the role of the Communist Party of China in socialist democracy. Mm -hmm. And you once said socialist democracy is enhanced by the leadership of the party and the leadership of the party is enhanced through socialist democracy. Could you elaborate more on these ideas? Uh, well, if I may make a small uh, push for a book I had published earlier th this year, no, last year, uh, it's actually on the history and theory of, of socialist governance, um, where I sort of studied this material right through from Marx and Engels up into practices in China today. Uh, and what happened noticeably um, a little bit over 100 years ago after the uh, Russian Revolution was it became clear that for developing a socialist form of governance and a socialist democracy, that the Communist Party had to be in a leadership position. Uh, how do you understand that? For Westerners especially, that sounds like a contradiction. It's either one or the other, but you actually have them relating to one another throughout the history as it developed. The term used for it is democratic centralism but it's democratic centralism which is uh, applied to governing the whole country and not just the CPC or a communist party. And the democratic centralism, the principles of that as it's developed through practice and theory is that without a robust democratic practice, 
you don't have a strong central element. And without a strengthened central element, you don't have robust democratic practices. So that's, that's the, the way the contradiction works. It's not either or, it's both and. And so the more established, more developed the democratic system is, the democratic processes are, the, the stronger is the leadership of the CPC and vice versa. They strengthen one another in the process of development. And this has been proven historically uh, that, that that's how it's developed. And to my mind, that is one of the most distinctive features about whole process people's democracy or socialist democracy. It's that relationship. It's absolutely crucial. People have to understand it. Um, and without that relationship, you don't have socialist democracy. Well, for many Westerners, it's hard to understand because for them, elections means democracy. That's right. But under the context of Chinese socialist democracy, it's a combination of election right. and also, I will say, procedural mm. democracy plus substantive democracy. So how yeah. do you understand, how can we better explain that concept mm. to people who are confused about this part? Well, one of the, as you point out uh, very correctly, uh, people in Western countries at least have become used to the idea that democracy just means elections. And, uh, you know, you might have an election every three or four or five years, and then by and large, people don't have a say in anything. And then that passes, but that's become fixed in, in people's heads. Um, and so another part of understanding the process, as, you, as you're saying, is the need to realize that elections are only one part one part of a substantive democratic process which, which draws on the will of the people and provides feedback and decisions to the people all the time, all the time, whether it's developing legislation, whether it's dealing with local grassroots issues, whether it's pursuing, uh, you know, the big questions. It's something when it's substantive, it takes place all the time, not just through rare days of elections and so on, and then that's it. Mm. Well, back to the Chinese whole process people's democracy, how does the advancement of this whole process people's democracy play a role in furthering the modernization of governance? Mm. The two go hand in hand, it seems to me. Um, and one thing that, that always impresses me about the situation in China is no matter how good something is, it can always be improved. You don't sit back and say, oh, look, it's been achieved. No the process of improving the governance structures is an ongoing process. Um, strengthening adherence to the constitution, ensuring that rule of law and the legal system keep being updated, uh, educating people about the process for participation in it. Um, so all of these, these aspects and modernization of the governance structure, uh, improvement of the governance structure, this is an ongoing process ongoing process, not just that times change, but the things can always be improved. This is a very interesting question I saw online. So one netizen asked, is it possible for China to become a democracy like America? Like when I firstly saw the question, there were two things pop up into my mind. First, why should China become a democracy like America? And secondly, why is American style democracy the best option? So what's your response to this kind of question? Uh, well, now most people in the world will probably answer that. Um, nobody wants to be like American style democracy. Look at it today. <laughs> it's a mess. It's a complete mess. Um, but that's, that's another aspect we can look at uh, in a moment, actually. No, what I, I t the approach I take to this is that the political structures, government, democratic system, uh, arises and is appropriate to the economic foundation in a country and its history and its culture. So when you've got, say, American-style democracy or, you know, Western-style democracy, uh, capitalist democracy, that grew over time as capitalist economic systems were growing in those countries. And in light of their own particular histories and cultural traditions, that particular political structure, for a time anyway, seemed to be an appropriate one there. But when you've got 
and there's many different examples, but take a Chinese situation with its own history, its own cultural tradition, and the establishment of the new China in a socialist system, and the economic system, which is quite distinct from all of that, call it what we will, socialist market economy, new type of planned economy, then you can't take a political system that grew up somewhere else and just put it on top of a different foundation. It's not going to work. It has to be a system that arises from the context. Uh, and so that's where it's, it's simply not going to happen. And if at some point, well, it's been tried in former colonised countries, such as Africa and elsewhere, and it doesn't work very well. So there is no one-size-fits-all political system? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's correct. You have to take into account, like I said, the history, culture, context, foundation, all those things. Yeah. Is this still possible for America or countries who claimed they have liberal democracy to understand China's socialist democracy or the whole process, people's democracy? Look, this is a really interesting question. And I think the way to begin with that is, uh, even in Western countries now, but especially in other places, uh, the West, and we have to remember that there are relatively few countries in the world and only about 12% of the world's population is facing a multi-dimensional crisis at the moment. And it's been building for some time, 50 years or so. It's economic, it's political, it's social, it's cultural. And what is starting to take place? Well, to get through this crisis may take them 100 years, as a friend of mine in Shanghai said last week. Um, and what they like so much like to do when they're facing troubles is blame somebody else. Uh, we've seen that time and again, blame someone else. And there's plenty of candidates. But there's been an interesting shift that's taken place in the last little while. They're starting to blame someone else, but inside the country. They're starting to see that there are problems internal and it seems to me that what's important is, in order to come to terms with this crisis, is first of all, stop blaming others, analyse the internal problems, and then find ways for renewal, different renewal. What does that mean for the current context? Um, thinkers uh, and common people are starting to dissociate, if you like, the political system. They know there's something wrong with the political system. It really is getting to a point where something has to be done. It may lead over time to a greater openness to listen, to pay attention to other models. Um, I might bring in something here that I've noticed very interesting over the last three or four years. I encounter more and more uh, potential students, young people, who want to come to China not to study, well, history, yes, Chinese culture. They want to study Marxism in China. They want to study Marxism in China, Marxist philosophy, Marxist history. And why is that? My talking with them, um, they're completely dissatisfied with the distorted, uh, um, completely false pictures of China that they get uh, through their regular sources. And they're starting to see what makes China tick. That's what they want to understand. Uh, however, currently, out of the 3,000 or so universities and colleges in China, all of the courses relating to Marxism, and as you know, there are many, many, many of them, are all in Chinese. There's not one available in English yet for the increasing number of people interested foreigners. Now, I see that as a signal of a beginning of a process of wanting to listen, wanting to learn about a very different situation and that includes the political system, it includes the practices of democracy, it includes the role of the CPC in all of those things. Maybe from the lessons you are giving at the Remy University could be a starting, good starting point for overseas students who want to learn more about Marxism. Uh, we're, wor we're working at that. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much Professor Bohr for your insightful opinions. Okay. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to be able to talk about these important things.